My name is Daniel, and I'm the developer of Splunky PSP, which is a remake of a game called Splunky Classic for PlayStation Portable. The original Splunky Classic is made in GameMaker, which is a proprietary tool for creating games. The license, under which DirectQ, the game's author, released its sources, states explicitly that they can be reused freely alongside with other assets, as long as this is not for one's profit. So this is fantastic, but in the same time very limiting, as an eager programmer can't just take the sources and build the game for so some retro console as long as Game Maker does not decide to support it, which is very unlikely to happen. However, there are still people who create and maintain free of charge homebrew tool chains, for example, DevKit Pro organization in case of Nintendo DS. This makes it possible to reuse original assets, take original sources as a point of reference, and recreate the whole game in C++ and some platform-specific rendering API. This is not my first Splunky project, as I started with Splunky NDS. Unfortunately, Nintendo DS rendering utilizes some very hardware-specific code, for example, writing to some specific address via DMA to make sprites updated. So, as I can't reuse the code, it still makes a very exciting possibility, because, you see, PSP supports very basic, very primitive subset of a commonly adopted rendering API called OpenGL. So, when I rewrite the renderer of Splunky NDS utilizing OpenGL ES 1.0, the game could be run pretty much everywhere, not only PSP, but PS Vita, Nintendo Switch, ordinary PCs, Macs, not even mentioning Android and iOS. This is fantastic. So this could be uh, this could be run everywhere, just like Doom is used to be ported to some ATMs, uh, smartwatches, calculators, printers, digital cameras, and so on. Uh, it could be run everywhere where some basic support for OpenGL is settled. This video covers documents the process from scratch to the point when I get to the tile renderer, when I get to a functioning multi-platform tile renderer, as this is still work in progress. That being said, I invite you to the rest of the video. So the first thing that I started working on was setting up the build system. I started wondering which targets do I need. I certainly needed a game target, which would be an executable containing the main function, the game logics, and the game loop. What I also needed was all the boilerplate that is required to start up an application with a window and OpenGL context on a certain platform. I wasn't sure what libraries will I encounter on different platforms. I imagine that there may be no implementation of SDL on some platform, but there may be some, let's say, GLFW fork instead. So I decided to make an abstraction layer over this in form of a target called video, which would be a statically linked library. In case of Linux, I choose dynamically linked SDL for providing graphical context. I picked SDL on PSP2, as I discovered that PSP toolchain provides SDL 1.25 amongst shipped libraries. Difference is, I would link it statically because of platform-specific constraints. I wrote an interface that would expose functionalities I wanted, but hiding the fact that SDL works underneath. I also knew that while I would obtain graphical context via my video target, which now encapsulates SDL, I will still have to possess a single point of OpenGL function declarations. I could not use system headers for OpenGL function declarations because they would differ between the platforms. I would need to have them within my own codebase. There is a solution for this. I chose OpenGL in a pretty ancient version, which is OpenGL 1.3 for desktops and OpenGL ES 1.0 for the PSP. ES stands for the embedded systems. I know that they are compatible, as the OpenGL standard guarantees it, so the only thing left was to provide the headers. Those headers could be generated with a tool called GLAD. 
Now having definitions of OpenGL functions for both platforms provided by GLAD and the OpenGL context provided by DSDL, I could build the game and actually render something. Let it be a single color using GL clear color and GL clear functions. Let it be simple blinking, but I would know it would be guaranteed that it would work on both platforms and without effort could be adapted to many more platforms in the future. As there was not enough of abstraction asserting multi-platform development, I also created one target specifically for handling input. As I later discovered, SDL implementation on PSP does not have working input polling. I could not get any event on PSP, whichever button I would press or release. So I knew that I would write platform-specific code on PSP for input polling. On Linux, I would use SDL's events as there was no such problem with its SDL implementation. Having this full view of the project, I would need a build system that would support conditional includes of files into targets. In one case, it would define GLAD target from headers with OpenGL ES 1.0 declarations and OpenGL 1.3 in other. Support conditional linking of targets. In one case, it would be linking to some PSP-specific library for polling input, but not in the other. I would also need it to be high level. I don't want to write a make file for every platform. I don't care about the details. I just want those targets to be built and then linked. I also want dependencies within the project to be managed on my behalf. I want the build system to decide which target to build first and how to link in correct order. And lastly, I need a build system that would easily allow me to cross compile from one platform to another. As in this example, I would cross compile from Linux to PSP, from x86 to MIPS32. So I choose CMake. Here it is, the root CMake file. As you see, it defines the executable Splunk PSP with uh, as a single point of source main CPP. It also links to the libraries called video and dependencies. Video I define here in the subdirectory, which is added here, and dependencies is added by calling this macro of mine, which depends on the platform that you are currently building to. Uh, so on Linux, it will look like adding dependencies target, which will carry those link definitions, like there's minus L SDL flag, minus L GLAD, minus L GL, minus L X11, and minus L dynamic linker. Uh, speaking of SDL, I should have probably linked to it calling find package and then linking to a target that was created, but I'll fix that later. Uh, also, there is this target compiled definitions call. Uh, this dependencies target will also carry this Spelunky PSP platform Linux definition, and every target that links to this dependencies target, for example Spelunky PSP executable, will have access to this macro definition in its source files, so it is handy in conditional branching depending on platform inside sources. Uh, for the PSP, Pretty much the same, but uh, the difference is that I'm linking a lot of platform-specific libraries uh, of the PSP. Uh, probably this one and many more is not used anyway, because I'm currently not using any of the capacity of this device. And also, what I define is this macro, this Simic macro. Uh, it does the extra job that is needed to create artifact for PSP as PSP will not accept an ordinary executable, uh, it accepts PBP files, which are just executables bundled with um, icons and backgrounds that are then rendered in case of uh, being in a PSP game menu. Mm. How does the CMake know what current platform is? Uh, this depends on the toolchain which, by the way, I owe to Wooly from the DOS project. Uh, it sets 
those common tools uh, to point to the toolchain directory, the PSP toolchain directory. So we have this C compiler, this C++ compiler, uh, this, this linker, this archiver, this stripping tool, and so on and so on. Uh, but in the end, it also defines this Palanqui PSP platform. This is my addition, actually. Uh, so this current platform just checks if this is defined. If not, we are on Linux and done. Uh, this will be more complicated when supporting more platforms, but it is not the case today. Mm, let's go to the code. Uh, as CMAKs are currently covered, uh, in main CPP, only thing I do is just clearing color using trigonometry. It will change during uh, as the time flows. Uh, I create this video singleton, dispose it in the end, and in between I initialize GL context and run this callback in a loop. Uh, how do I initialize GL context and create a window? Uh, via SDL, of course, on both platforms. I call SDL init. Mm, create window uh, with OpenGL support and then uh, having this window I call glad so it would actually load pointers to OpenGL functions in runtime. Uh, I do the same on PSP. Uh, also there's some boilerplate like getting window with, turning down GL, swapping buffers. I wanted some interface that would provide abstraction in case that in future there would be some other platform that would not have SDL support. Uh, like, for example, I could compile it to PS Vita in future, whatever. Uh, as you see, it actually uses some PSP specific header inside. Uh, how do I actually link a proper GLAD and conditionally branch those files? Uh, so, if the Lucky PSP platform is Linux, then it's GLAD OpenGL 1.3 and Linux. If not, it's OpenGL ES 1.0 and PSP. So it visits different folders defining different targets. Uh, actually, in both cases it defines video target, but the content is different. Uh, there's this GLAD, you can see those CMAKs. Uh, how do I actually obtain those GLAD headers? Like, how do I get this GLAD.h, uh, as you see, with those uh, OpenGL function definitions? Like, let's see, GL clear color. You can see there is a it looks like a mess, but that's because it's automatically generated. Uh, how do I obtain those headers? Le let's visit GLAD generator. Mm, what I need is to specify that I want GL 1.3 and even GLAD knows that it will be compatible with GL ES 1.0. Then I click generate and I get an archive with source file and a header. That being said, let's run this. You see, uh, it changes color in time. Uh, it's not entirely magnificent until you realize that from the same code I will not now cross-compile uh, to the PSP using a set of scripts that I created. Those are not actually needed as those are three or four lines like they are calling CMake only, uh, but I wanted them so anyone would clone the repository and straight away could configure and build project. So now let's call the other script, which is build PSP, uh, which is actually this script, and now we have the final artifact. So let's get to the build PSP and then call an emulator, which is PS. So we have blinking, but in a proud cross compile, cross cross compiled multi platform way. Uh, actually, those will not blink in the same speed because I am not limiting frame rate. 
it's easy thing, I will do this later. Uh, but thing is, I'm using the same code. But it doesn't only work on an emulator. Let's connect the PSP. Running USB mode. Now building the project. And let's copy it. Just like this. Now let's run it. And it's working. The next thing I started working on was the resource compiler. The game contains a variety of assets like fonts, like sprites, like music, like sounds and there must be a way to deliver them within or alongside the executable. File systems operations are very obvious choice and here is why I didn't pick them. You may say that, well, file system operation exists in the standard of C++, at least partially from C++14, and they do, they are reliable, but as long as you are on a Mac, on a Windows or on Linux, uh, when you try to use them on Android, for example, from within Android activity, within native code, uh, they will not work. I tried once on a different project uh, loading some assets from the APK and I had to resort to SDL function to just give me the pointer to the asset and I would load it. Uh, same goes for iOS for example because file system operations don't allow you to access files of other applications for example so you are only allowed to save files inside your sandbox and the sandbox is not really intended for saving assets uh, so what is the other way the other way is compiling resources inside the executable so you'd have a single file delivered uh, this has a serious drawback right because your binary will be bloated it will be huge all the assets and executables are loaded into the memory once they are executed. So you will actually take a portion of memory that you may need to use uh, some later uh, way. But Splunky is a little game, it has a little of assets, so this is not really a problem. And to give you some numbers, all the assets from Splunky uh, all mentioned like music, like sounds, like sprites, like fonts, they all uncompressed weigh around 20 megabytes and PSP has 32 megabytes at least. I said at least because they upgraded the number in the later models. Mm -hmm. And that's why I picked a resource compiler. Well, the idea is, is to write a resource compiler executable which is around 100 lines, it's not big, most of this is file system operations and parsing file so what it does is it loads file that uh, which, which is file name is passed as an argument loads it and then for every byte of this file and encodes this as a char array, uh, char array element. Uh, how does it work uh, practically? Well, let's create a text file. Let's create something like this is a text file. Let's save it. Contents are like this. Uh, and what's the way of accessing 
this uh, this this text file after compilation. Uh, firstly, this resource compiler must be called on this test.txt. Then output file name must be passed txt hpp. So we have now a header file. Let's see it. It looks like this. Every byte of this text file was compiled as a char array element. Uh, presumably this was uh, ASCII or UTF-8 encoding, so uh, every byte or every, every character was encoded as a number. And now this header file can be included in your code. Uh, let's let's do a simple test. Like let's change this file to be a CVP file like this. Test.txt CPP. Now let's edit this. Let's include the IO stream and let's add a main function. And for every byte. Let's print it. So now let's compile this. And now let's add executable writes and call it. It printed. This is a text file. Uh, if you see this, uh, if you check this test as a binary and print any strings that it would contain and grab by text file this is a text file so it actually is inside the binary uh, so I'll check out uh, current master branch to show you how I um, utilize this resource compiler when loading textures. Uh, so let's just do let's regenerate the Simic project and the texture loading which I added later uh, It looks like this. I have this PNG file that I compiled into the header and I include it in a namespace level tiles image. So this header declares data, char, char array calls data, so to not conflict it with other files that I can possibly include, uh, I include it within a namespace and then access this data uh, when uploading to the GPU. Uh, like this, level tiles image data and size of level tiles image data, which returns size of this array. And that's it. That's this is this is how simple is compiling resources within the binary. As I further advanced, I wanted to have a cross-platform logging vendor in case of errors and simply to track program execution. My aim to have the same message logged into the terminal window on desktop and in case of PSP also being logged when run via an emulator. The first library I tried was spdlog which I otherwise very much recommend but this time I failed at cross compiling it to the PSP because of missing mutex implementation in provided standard library. SPD-Log does not provide an option to disable multi-threading features, sadly. As you see, there are missing symbols. Mutex in namespace std does not name a type. Recursive mutex in namespace std does not name a type. 
and so on. So I started looking up for other simple loggers if STD implementation if this is so stripped on this platform. I thought that I could use some C library and this is how I got to the log.c which as it describes is a simple logging library implemented in C99 standard. So as I incorporated this logging library in my vendor logger subdirectory and linked it to the main executable and then called it from my main function It simply worked. Uh, I was curious whether this will work simply out of the box when I run the application from the PSP emulator. So I called strips config PSP, strips build PSP, and then I added strips run PSP, which was missing before. And as you see, there is still a log call. It is somehow different, but still the main content, which is logging level, time, and this uh, file and line, and the final content is there. Uh, what is done in this script, however, is grabbing by Splunky. I had to add this this special label so to filter logs that are coming from the emulator are and are not related to the game. And this is how I added logging vendor. After the initial rendering framework has been set up, it was the time to write a tile render. And I have taken two assumptions. Firstly, I want all the tiles to be packed into a single entity, into a single texture using a texture packer. Uh, this is to save OpenGL texture binding costs, so this is a optimization technique. And secondly, this artifact of packing this texture and metadata, I want them to be serializable in runtime, so I presume they would be in some easily uh, parsable, serializable format, like for example JSON. And looking for such program, I found one, it's called Atlas C, and I liked it from the start. That's because it exposes an interface in command line, I don't need any shiny interface with previews or manual corrections. Uh, packing some uniform 16x16 16 16 tiles is what I need. Uh, so this is great, it's also in C and has no external dependencies. Mm, so let's see the Atlas C. Here is Atlas's C GitHub repository. It takes a list of image files on input that will be outputted in the resulting tile sheet. It also takes the outputted tile sheet file name. There's also a number of optional arguments, like for example maximum width and height. This will be useful, as PSP's GPU will accept images no bigger than 512 by 512. Same goes for the power of 2 option. It will be needed because some legacy GPUs, PSP's GPU included, will accept only images of dimensions being power of 2. There is also this option to specify border and padding. This can be used to either pack the tiles tightly or with some space in between. There is this mesh option and I will come back to this in a moment. In this directory I have prepared a list of tiles that are needed to render a cave level in Spolanki. So let's call Atlas C and make a sprite sheet out of this. So let's specify a wildcard to use all the uh, PNG files in this directory as an input. And let's also specify border and padding to be zero because I want them to be tightly packed. Uh, I want the maximum width to be this and maximum height to be the same. Uh, I also want a mesh to be outputted and I have to pass the output file name, let it be tiles. 
So here is the output at tile sheet. And as you see, tiles are packed tightly and the uh, constraint on the dimension is respected. It's 512 by 32. Uh, so let's inspect this tiles.json file. Let's print it. Let's format it. So in the root of the document, we have this fields describing the tiles.png file, uh, its name, its width, and its height. What is also specified is this sprites array. In sprites array, there is an entry for each of those tiles. So for example, starting from this tile, from 0.png, which is here, we have its sides uh, and the mesh. The mesh specifies positions and UVs. What's the difference between the positions array and the UVs array? The UVs uh, contain the, the exact portion of the sprite sheet containing this specific tile, this 0.png in this example, and those positions specify x, y, uh, specify proportions of the image, the frame on which the texture will be stick to. And this goes on for each of those tiles. So I compiled the resulting JSON and the image using my resource compiler. So in the project called Level Renderer, I have this include generated subdirectory where I place the JSON and the PNG files. Mm. The JSON is pretty big and Slion hardly handles this, so I'll not dare to open the PNG file as it is binary data in text encoding as well, believe me, that Slion will not like this. Uh, so once I had those JSON and PNG files in the binary, I needed a way to actually parse the information that is contained inside. So I went for a search for C++ library that would parse the JSON file. I found this library called nlohman slash JSON. Uh, I tried this, I failed at cross-compiling this, I tried the art of cpp slash json, I again failed at compiling this. Uh, the same thing that uh, stopped me from using spd log, missing um, some parts of the standard library, stopped me uh, again from using C++ library. It wasn't mutex, but some other part, I'm not going into the details. Mm, so, my backup plan was just like in case of the logger to use some C library, and that's how I found this C JSON. As you see, it is of MIT license, so I could uh, incorporate this, this, this library into my uh, code base under vendor C JSON. So once I did this, I linked it to the level render project and at this point I could use it freely to parse the, the JSON file. But before we visit texture parsing code, let's have a quick tour over Spelunky levels. This is main menu level. As you see, everything except for some details like the game's logo or the credits title below is made of tiles. How would you store this level in code? Well, you could assign the number to each unique tile type, resulting in a kind of two-dimensional array. And this is exactly how this level is stored in the code. A simple two-dimensional array of integers storing values in range of map tile enumerator type. With a little of imagination, one can see map features even when looking at this array. To make image parsing easier, names of each tile images are numbers corresponding to the value from the enumerator. 
An example of this arrow trap image is 11.png and it corresponds to a numerator value arrow trap left, which when in turn casted to an integer is 11. But going back to the parsing code. In level render class, I declare load textures function, in which I parse the document from a pointer to resource compiled JSON file. A few lines later, I parse value of tilesheet name and its dimensions, which correspond to these three fields in the root of the document. Later, I do parsing of each individual tile from the sprite's array. As you see, I compare value of current enumerator type plus .png extension to the file name, and if it matches, I load the UVs, positions, and indices of this tile type. Let's break point here and here to actually see log calls. We've parsed the root of the document, parsing metadata out of texture atlas level tiles.png with and its height. Let's continue. And now we've parsed each individual tile, so it matched 0.png to map tile type nothing and 11.png to arrow trap left. To render a quad, by which I mean a rectangle, in terms of OpenGL pipeline, one needs to draw two triangles, as the base of rendering shapes in OpenGL is a triangle. OpenGL operates on meshes. Meshes are collections of vertices with some properties that vary depending on what you are trying to achieve. As what I want is to render a texture on a quad, for every tile I have to push its four vertices, each of them described by its position x and y's, and texture coordinates u and v's. This is what I do in the batch vertices function in level renderer. I have three separate collections for each property, x, y, z, u, v, and indices. Indices tell OpenGL in what order to visit each vertex. By using them, one can reuse vertices that are already in the collection. So, for each tile in the map, I push its positions, indices, and UVs. When finished, I merge each of these three collections into a single array. This is to have a very tiny performance boost from data locality, as CPU when executing this function will have all data in one place, it will not have to jump from one array pointer to another, and it will probably cache this region of RAM. Let's finally see the render function that is called in the game loop. I bind the texture containing all the tiles, then I tell OpenGL how to interpret the array of vertices that I pass, and finally I issue a render call. So how does it look like in practice? It resembles the original one pretty close, doesn't it? Let's compare it to the original one. Obviously, it didn't all go so smooth. Grad didn't work well with SDL on PSP and I didn't know why. The OpenGL function pointers that it meant to load in runtime were null, even though I called subsequent functions. After a long investigation, I found out that the problem lies within the toolchain in the shipped SDL, so I posted a pull request which was eventually matched to the master branch. There was also a problem with the Atlas C texture packer, as there was some off by one error in its source code, and the 16x16 16 16 tiles that they passed on input were outputted as 15x15 15 15 stripped out of the last column and the last row, even though UVs were still outputted as 16x16, 16 16, and this all resulted in such rendering artifacts.
Source of the problem wasn't easy to spot, so briefly I blamed pixel bleeding, but when the classic solution for pixel bleeding being half pixel correction didn't work, I finally started to realize where the problem was. I posted an issue on GitHub and it was eventually fixed, for which I am very grateful. Tile renderer was in the beginning tremendously slow and I was starting to think about all those clever optimization techniques like patching only the tiles that are in camera's viewport instead of rendering all the map, but in the end the thing that doubled or even tripled the FPS was simply changing texture filtering. As the last thing, I want to acknowledge my friend Rafa who is setting up the CI, so right now every tagged commit that is pushed to the master branch will trigger a build to both platforms, resulting in artifacts being uploaded to the GitHub's releases tab. Builds will also be triggered on each pull request, although with no artifacts to download, as this is only to validate whether the build finishes successfully. And addressing the question of the first release date, uh, taking into consideration the current economic crisis and the uh, following societal breakdown, probably this summer. And this being said, till the next time.